day that we can together worship, pray to you, and learn from your words. Bless us, Lord, forgive our sins and our wrongdoings, sanctify us, give us your spirit so that we can know, we can learn, we can digest, and we can do your words. Bless us, Lord, help your uh, sinful servant that he can deliver your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to apologize first because I think I need to I need to change the passage. Yeah. So previously, uh, because this week I have been very busy, previously I think I will deliver a passage from uh, Luke 12. But uh, after uh, some days of thinking, I think I will, uh, I think I need to, I need to deliver a more fundamental message first. And because of that, I will focus my message today on the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. The Gospel of Mark, I will read for you. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Yeah. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. From, the, from uh, chapter 1, 14 to 28. The Gospel of Mark. Yeah. The first chapter, from verse 14 to verse 28. I read it for you. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority he even gave order to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly on the whole region of Galilee. So, what I want to share with you today is how to experience God. Yeah. How to experience God, how to know God and experience God. So, many times for all of us, God is something very abstract, yeah. very far. Yeah. We cannot see God. We cannot, sometimes we think that we cannot talk directly in person with God, or we cannot feel God's presence. So, it's, it's, it's been so abstract. And the Bible told us that the way to experience God is to experience the kingdom of God. Yeah. So to experience God is to experience the kingdom of God. Now the passage, the passage started like this, after John was put in prison. So this is very dark. Yeah. This was something not quite good. The beginning, uh, the beginning seems inauspicious. Yeah. So for many Jews at that time, for many, even for John's disciples, or for many uh, Jewish believers, uh, they want to question who, who, who was in charge? Was it God or Herod? Yeah. Was it God or the Romans, for instance? And sometimes in our life, sometimes in our struggle, we also ask the same questions. Now, which one is stronger? God or economical factors, for instance? God or my uh, the vicissitudes, the, the many happenings in my life? Yeah. We want to know. How we know God in the midst of all of this? How can we experience God? And <clears throat> the Bible said, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the good news of God. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. What is the meaning of God's kingdom? When we hear the word kingdom, yeah, we tend to think it as a kind of, you know, geographical concept, yeah, like United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. The kingdom of Japan, for instance. Kingdom has certain area, right? A certain area, certain boundaries. When you learn geography in your school, you know that some 
some countries right now are, are still kingdoms, right? But the Bible is quite different. When the Bible says the kingdom of God, the so-called kingdom here is about a kind of situation, a kind of condition. So it's more active, it's more dynamic. It's not about geography, it's not about place, but it's about atmosphere. It's about certain kind of situation. So the kingdom of God means the power of God. God's kingdom means God's power, God's victory. And how to experience God's power? In the Bible, experiencing God's power means experiencing God's liberation. So God's power is the power to liberate. Yeah. So one of the most famous stories in the Bible is the story of Exodus, right? The Israelites was liberated by God to leave Egypt and to enter into Canaan and into the promised land. So this is the expression of the power of God. So we as Christians, we need to emphasize more about God's power. I read a, a story about a pastor uh, about 150 years ago in Germany. Yeah. So he pastored a church that was quite languishing. Yeah, the church did not experience God's power. So everybody just, just went to the church as a kind of obligation, as a kind of duty. So one time, yeah, uh, to make the story short, the pastor discovered, discovered that one, of, one or two of the congregational members uh, play with black magic. Play with black magic. And there are some bad happenings, some strange happenings at night in the house. So the pastor tried to pray with them. And it required, it takes about several months that the demons can finally go out. And when the demons go out, so it's a kind of, it's, it's during December 31st, then, yeah, the, the village hear a kind of loud shrieking yeah, from their house. The demon said, Jesus is the victim. And then those family, yeah, several people who prepared black magic, they, their life is transformed. They become very nice Christian, and that place in Germany becomes a center of a revival. Yeah. That's the power of God. We want to experience God's power, God's liberating power. Uh, we want God to free ourselves, free ourselves from our bad habits, bad thoughts from our, yeah, our misery, from our sins. Now Jesus said, this time has come, the kingdom of God is near. This time has come. Now the time has come in the, in the original language in Greek. The time, you can, you can understand the time as the moment has come. So time and moment is different, right? Yeah. What is time? Time sometimes can mean something in chronology, yeah, time, past, present, and future. And time, to, to, to make this a kind of uh, more fitted, sometimes time makes us poor. Yeah, yeah. When we are aware of time, yeah, so for instance, when you listen to the sermons, or when you listen to the teachers, and you look at your watches frequently, that means what? The sermons, or the lectures, <laughs> we are so aware of that. But moment is different. Moment is a very important time. So for instance, when you fall in love, yeah, when you fall in love, time seems stops. And that's the moment. Yeah. When you need to make a decision, where should I go for my college? Where should I go for work? And that's a kind of moment. A moment is different from time. Time is boring. Time is something very mundane. But Jesus said, this is the moment. You need to make decision. God wants to come to the world, but God wants to come through you. God wants to bless the world, God want, God want, but God wants to bless the world through blessing you first. So in this moment, Jesus said, in this moment, you know, the kingdom of God is near. Now, this is also the inadequacy of our language. 
in translating Greek. Yeah. So I said before, time in Greek means moment, this moment. You need to make decision. This is urgent. Yeah. But also, the kingdom of God is near. The so-called near here, when we said near, is not something that is not arrived. So near means that it has arrived. It's, it's in front of you. But it's not fully arrived. So something like that. Yeah? So it's already and not yet. God's kingdom is in front of you. Jesus said something like that. So it's quite near. Yeah? So you need to grasp it. You need to enter the kingdom. Repent and believe the good news. So what Jesus wants to ask here is to enter the kingdom. To enter the kingdom by doing what? Now, Previously, I mentioned to you the story of Exodus, right? Israelites enter the promised land by leaving Egypt. So this is this is the logic of every journey. When you make, when you want to enter a certain area, you need to leave <coughs> to leave your past area. Your boss, for instance, asks you to go to Chicago. You need to leave Los Angeles, enter Chicago, right? So right now, Jesus asks you to enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are two movements. You need to live something and entering something. Now, this is very important. Later I will repeat this. Living and entering. Now, repent. Repent means living. Believe means enter. Yeah. So repent, Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. Two verbs. Repent and believe. Two verbs means living and entering. So what do we need to live? What do we need to live? First, we need to live wrong view of what? Wrong view of sovereignty. Wrong view of what? Wrong view of sovereignty. What is the meaning of wrong view of sovereignty? We always think that we are sovereign. We need to live our own kingdom. So everyone our of everyone of us, everyone of us is small kings and small queens. <laughs> our life is our own kingdoms or queendoms. I'm free. I'm sovereign here. So this is the wrong view of freedom. We think we can we can decide in accord with our own desire. I'm free. But if God is the king, if God comes to rule, then God will will one will overthrow you. You are no longer the queen. You are no longer the king. But God will sit on the throne of your heart. You need to surrender your life to God. Many times the so-called freedom the so-called freedom, our, you know, our age, our age, our modern age, especially the Western culture, always emphasize need. Be true to yourself. Do everything that you want. But many times the so-called freedom is illusory. For instance, for instance, if you ask, if you tell your friends, smoking is dangerous. Smoking can cause cancer, for instance. And your friend said, this is my freedom. I have the freedom to smoke. I have the right to smoke. Do you think this freedom is something genuine? For instance, if you have a friend who is addicted to marijuana or addicted to heroin and his health deteriorates, and you said, you need to stop consuming these kind of things. But he said, no, I'm free. Do you think this is a good freedom? No. So actually, our freedom many times is the freedom to worship idols. Our freedom is the freedom to look for what? To look for false gods. When we say, I want to worship myself, we inevitably worship what? Our money, our look, our fame. So when God wants to overthrow ourselves, that's for our own good. Okay. Now entering God's kingdom, believing God. Now believing God. Now, I told you in the beginning of this sermon that God is many times quite abstract. 
quite unclear. But it is precisely, it is precisely because God many times is quite unclear that you cannot manipulate God. Something that is too clear can be easily used. But if God sometimes quite seems quite far, quite unclear, you can learn to, to trust. You can learn to obey. If God is very concrete and very clear, you can easily manipulate God. So something that is unclear can be compensated. Can be compensated by what? Can be compensated by God's own authority. Can be compensated by God's own attractiveness. For instance, at night, yeah, at night during the day, many children when they walk with their parents, many children like to what? Like to play around by themselves. And sometimes they get lost, right? But at night, children do not know where to go. They are not clear. So they tend to what? They tend to hold their parents' hands. And they sometimes are not clear whether their parents know where to go, right? <laughs> they do not know that. But what they know is what? Their parents left them. What they know is that their parents are wise. So we do not know God's plan. And we do not know what lies ahead of us. But what is unclear can be compensated by God's trustworthiness, by God's love. So this is the first story. The first story when Jesus preached the kingdom of God. Yeah. Now the second story, which is quite related, is when Jesus called the first disciples. Yeah. You know what is very strange to this story? Jesus said, follow me. These disciples immediately followed him. This is very strange. These disciples did not ask him, How much is my salary? How about insurance? Do you have dental? These disciples do not ask Jesus, did not ask Jesus any free time, any vacation a year? What is our future? No. They just suddenly immediately follow him. And we, all, we were also told here, we are also told here that John, John, have, John and John's family also had hired men. It means that they are quite rich. At the time, only rich people can have hired men. So they just leave their profession and they follow Jesus immediately. Now, this told us that Jesus is the embodiment of God's own kingdom. Now, I told you before that God's kingdom is not about geography, right? God's kingdom is about situation, about condition. So because God's kingdom is about certain condition, Jesus himself is the expression of God's kingdom. So when I said to you in the beginning, to experience God is to, to experience God's kingdom. It's also, at the same time, implies that to experience God is to experience Jesus. He has the authority when he calls people for him. Now, I told you before, I told you before, remember, when Jesus said the kingdom is near, it means that what? The kingdom already in front of you. So where? Where is the kingdom? It's me, Jesus said. So, the kingdom is near, means what? I am in front of you. When you see Jesus, you see the kingdom. When you experience Jesus, you experience the kingdom. Now, I told you before, what is unclear about God can be compensated by God's attractiveness. The attractiveness of God, the trustworthiness of God can be seen through Jesus. So to experience God's power means to experience Jesus. Now how to experience Jesus as the expression of God's kingdom? How to experience Jesus as the expression of God's kingdom? Don't forget about two verbs. Living and enter. Living. Now the first, the first living is living what? 
living our false view of freedom, our false view of sovereignty. Now the second is living our false view of life. Yeah. These people, John, Peter, these people, they have, they had, yeah, they had a kind of ideal life picture. For them to be ideal, to have a life, is to follow their father's who have becoming what? Fisherman. That's their ideal life. And when Jesus said, follow me, they need to dethrone themselves. Their kingdom were overthrown, and they become the fishermen of, the fisher of man. So we have our own ideal life. We have our ideal life. When I was in Singapore, people told me that the ideal life for people in Singapore is 3C. What is 3C? First, car. Second, condo, <laughs> condominium, and third, credit cards. <laughs> three C. If you have three C's, yeah, your life is very good. So we have our own ideal lives. For some people, the ideal life is what? Probably becoming Miss Universe or Master Universe or something like that. For other people, to become, to be, to have ideal life is becoming a successful businessman. The richest people in North America, the next Bill Gates, for instance, or the next Jeff Bezos. Yeah. For other people, for other people like me, probably the ideal life is becoming the most successful pastor, for instance, the most successful professor, for instance. So we have our own ideal life. And sometimes when we meet Jesus, we need to put some distance with our ideal. Our ideal life is not absolute. Where did God, God call us? Where does God call us? During, do, that's when what? When we are engaged in our ideal life. Because sometimes, when we attain our life, yeah, when we actualize our own ideals, we do not want to go on. We are people who are what? Who like, uh, this is the, a fancy word for that, who like our status quo. Mm -hmm. We enjoy our life, right? We enjoy our ideal life. So we do not want to go on. It is precisely there when God calls you. Follow me. It is precisely there when you do not want to go on, when you feel comfortable, when you think that you know what you are going to do with your life. You hear Jesus' voice for me. But sometimes, sometimes, people who do not want to go on are also those people who are bored with their life. Who think that there is no interesting future. Who are not quite concerned with what they want to do. For those people, Jesus will also say, follow me, learn from me. So Jesus calls every one of us in our own station of life. Yeah. However, those who do not want to go on also include those who are suffering. Those who suffer a lot, who are disappointed with life, they think there is no future for them. The future is so bleak. Jesus will call them to follow me and learn from me. Yeah. So this calling, this calling, follow me, is for those who do not want to go on. Who are those who do not want to go on? They think that their life is very comfortable, or those who think that their life is boring, meaningless. Or those who think that they are very depressed and they are very suffering and they do not they do not want to go on because they think that there's no future for them. For those people, Jesus said, keep going on by following me. So living, living means what? Living our false view of life. Now entering, 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 believing. What is the soul part of entering here? Believing means that you want to be with Jesus 
you want to walk with Jesus, you want to serve with Jesus, you want to be with Jesus. So the most important thing in your life right now, the most important thing in your life right now is not what you experience. Many times for us, the most important thing in life is whether life is nice or not. Whether these things that I do is good or not, for instance. Yeah? Whether it's comfortable or not. So that's our focus about life. Tomorrow is Monday. Tomorrow is Monday. Ugh, I hate Mondays. Yeah. Because for those of you who are students, I hate Mondays because what? I need to go to school. For those of you who work, you hate Mondays because what? Monday is the day of meetings. Endless meetings. Yeah, we have so many meetings. I hate meetings. <laughs> so I, I sometimes I joke with my students. I think there will be many meetings in hell. <laughs> yeah, endless meetings. Yeah. So that's the way we see life. Life is about what? Life is about being. It's about whether I like it or not. Whether I'm happy or not. But life is about what? It's about whether you are with Jesus or not. So together with Jesus, being with Jesus. So whether it's bad or good, whether it's nice or not, whether it's pleasant or not, comfortable or not, all of those are just the means to experience Jesus. To be with Jesus and what? To walk with Jesus. So you want to learn with Jesus how to experience Jesus in the midst of happiness of how to experience Jesus in the midst of boredom. How to learn from Jesus in the midst of suffering. You want to walk with Jesus. Not just walk with Jesus. Jesus called you to be his co-workers. To be his partners. You want to serve with Jesus. So this is to experience God. What is it? To be with Jesus. To walk with Jesus. To serve Jesus. This is the kingdom. So when you ask for God's power, when you want to experience God's power, it's mainly not the power to be rich. It's mainly not the power to be healthy. Although sometimes it includes those. It's mainly the power to, to be with Jesus. The power to walk with Jesus. The power to work with Jesus to serve Jesus. So our life becomes Jesus-centered. So many times Jesus is not the center of our life because for us, Jesus is not the most important. Jesus is not the most lovable. To be in the kingdom of God means that Jesus is our Lord. He is the King of Kings. We want to follow Him. Now the last story, the last episode. Yeah. So these three stories, Jesus preaching the kingdom, Jesus calling the first disciples, and Jesus entering the synagogue to preach. These three stories are actually one unit. They explain and convey one thing about the power of God. Now the, third, the third story is when Jesus entered the synagogue, Jesus preached. When Jesus preached, People feel, wow, this is different. Yeah, this is different. They, Jesus taught them as one who had the power, the authority. So the power of God comes from hearing the word of God. So how can we experience the power of God? When we hear the word, follow me. That's the power of God. When Jesus preached, the congregation member experience God's power. When Jesus, when Jesus drove out an evil spirit, he drove out an evil spirit with his words. So we experience God's power with his words, through his words. So that's why, in order to stay in him, we need to read the Bible regularly. We need to read the Bible prayerfully. Now, one of the center of the last story is about Jesus driving out, exorcising demons. Now demons, yeah, demons in the Bible, demons or spirits, 
are about powers. They are evil power and they are good power in the world. So demons give people bad powers. But God gives us the true power, good power. So how to experience, how to learn about experiencing God's kingdom in this three story, in the third story? Remember the verb that I told you? What? Living and entering. First, we are living the false view of power. Second, we are living, abandoning the false view of life. Now, third, we are living the false view of power. Sorry. First, we are living the false view of freedom. The false view of life. Now, the third one, the false view of power. You know what? This reality, this world is full of power. Full of power. First, what is the most basic power? The power, the energy of your body. Chinese, uh, Chinese has a saying, your body is your most basic capital. Without your body, you cannot do anything. Right? So it's very important to keep healthy body. Body is about physical power. It's about physical power. What else? But having your body is not enough. You need to have intellectual power. That's why you go to school. Going to school, being educated, you gain what? Intellectual power. You can analyze situation. You can make decision. That's power. But intellectual power is not enough. You need to gain people's respect. You need to have to establish connection. That's important in business, right? So it's about what? A reputational power. The power of your name. Not only that, we see many power in this world. The power of money. Money is quite powerful. Right? What else? Economical power. The force of economy in society. What else? Political power. Yeah. So, to live in this world, to live in this world is to learn how to navigate through powers. How to navigate through powers. How can we make use of economical power, the power of money, the power of reputation, the power of our body, political power, the power of society, and to give us what? To give us benefits. So, we are inside the network of powers. We are inside the network of powers. We need to manipulate powers. So that's why our view of others and ourselves and our view of God determined by what? By power. Yeah. How about our view of God? We want to believe God. We want to pray to God. Why? Because we need power. God gives me more money. Because I need money. I need the power of money. God gives me more friends. Gives me more reputation. Because I need the social power. God gives me help. Because I need my physical power. So if God doesn't give us these powers, we are disappointed in God. So our reaction to God is decided by what? By powers. Not only that, our reaction to others also decided by powers. We want to befriend those who are in powers, right? Yeah. Oh, you need to know him. Right? Oh, because he has power. He has power. He has strong connection. You know to know this man, why? Right? He is very rich. Yeah. You need to befriend him, why? Because he is very strong. So that's our attitude toward others. So for those who do not have power, <coughs> for those who are poor, for those who are unhealthy, for those who are not well connected, we sometimes do not want to be too close to them. I will pray for you, <laughs> yeah. but I do not. I do not want to be too close to you. Yeah. Okay. So that's also our attitude to ourselves. When we have physical power, social power, 
we like ourselves, we love ourselves, right? But when we don't have power, we resent ourselves. We have low self-esteem. <coughs> so what is low self-esteem? I have nothing. I'm not healthy. I'm not as beautiful as my friend. I'm not as famous as my friend. Yeah. I'm not. A... So, you know, we are in the network of power, but we are in enslaved by by power. So our attitude to God, our attitude to others, and our attitude to ourselves is decided by wrong view of power. But the power will enslave us. The power will enslave us, and later when we die. We see that we have nothing. We have nothing to bring. Later we will find out that people's attitude toward us is superficial. Later we find out that we do not know God in ourselves. We are finished. So we need to live our false view of power and entering kingdom. Entering the kingdom of God means what? Being the outsider of the network of power. Admitting in front of God, God, I am powerless. So the Bible said, who will inherit the kingdom of God? The Bible said, who will inherit the kingdom of God? Those who are poor in the spirit. Poor in the spirit means what? You acknowledge in front of God that you are without power. God, I can have I can do nothing. Even if I can enjoy my money, my body, my friends, all of those come from you, not from me. So we want to be a battery, to be a source of power. But no, I'm not the source of powers. So sometimes you admit in front of God, no God, I'm nothing. You are everything. I need you. I want to rely on you. When we believe in God this way, we are different. Our attitude to God is different. We are not resentful to God. And we know that God accepts us no matter who we are. God accepts us unconditionally. God loves us even though we are powerless. And not only that, because we accept God's grace, we want to befriend others even though they do not have power. We want to pay attention to those who need us the most. And not only that, we can make peace with ourselves. Even though I am without physical beauty, even though I lack money, even though people, many people do not like me, that's okay. I'm accepted by God. See, it's liberating. It's liberating. And when you are like that, when you are like that, you will channel different power. You will channel the power of God. God's own power. The power of the kingdom to come. Supernatural power. So sometimes people ask Christian, how can you? in the midst of misery, in the midst of suffering, how can you still be joyful? What power is this? How can you, when you people do not like you, you can still forgive them? This is a different power. This is the power of God. We want to be a channel of God's power. So according to Martin Luther, we are called to be little Christ. I told you before, Jesus Christ embodies God's kingdom, right? And you and I, as little Christ, people can experience God's power through you. So, to recap, we need to experience God. But in the Bible, to experience God means what? To experience God's kingdom. To enter into God's kingdom. And to enter requires two verbs, living and entering. Living what? Living false view of freedom. Yeah. We are not the master of ourselves. Living false view of life. Our ideal life is not everything. Our comfort and discomfort is not the most important. 
living our view of power. We should not be enslaved by power. Living, entering what? Entering the kingdom is believing God, even though sometimes he is unclear. But he's trustworthy. Means what? Means embracing Jesus. To be with Jesus, to walk with Jesus, and what? To serve with Jesus. And third, what? To become poor in front of God. To tell God, I'm powerless in front of you. Take my life and let it be. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I have so many shortcomings. So many aspects of my life that I do not like. I have so many sadness that I will surrender in my life. So I hope and I pray that every one of you, every one of you can channel God's power in your life. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are really thankful that you summon us today, Lord, to experience you by leaving our false views, by being dethroned, but by embracing your kingdom. Lord, we are powerless. We do not have this power. We ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for the Spirit of Jesus to strengthen us, to eliminate our rebellions and weaknesses, and to bless us that we can be with Jesus always. We can sense his presence, that we can walk with Jesus, learn from him in all of our life situations and we can serve with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.